Good evening to you. Those of you joining at home or those of you joining here, please open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And we on Wednesday nights have started last Wednesday with talking about rebuilding our foundation, specifically applying the book of Nehemiah to us as a church. But these principles are applicable to all of life, to our homes, to our relationship with God. But I'm praying God will use Nehemiah in the rebuilding of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Last Wednesday, we started with some important foundational things from God's Word. Uh, Both of them are truths from Jesus Himself. One is that the stresses of life are not the reason sinful things come out of us. Sinful things come out of us because they're inside of us. Secondly, the stresses of life are never the cause for the collapse of a house. The collapse is based on whether or not you build on the right foundation. If you build on the sand, you collapse. If you build on the solid rock, you don't collapse. And so Nehemiah 1 begins with this sobering reality. In chapter 1, Nehemiah cares about God's people, learns that God's people are in great disarray and and distress, and then he does the hard but very important thing. He confesses his own sin and acknowledges that we need help. We need God's help to change, to, to, to rebuild. But he has confidence that that can happen because of God's word, what God has promised in the Mosaic law. So Nehemiah prays scripture, which we've been talking about for for really six months. God, because you said you would bless those who obey your word, on that confidence, we ask you to please rebuild your your people. So now we pick up in chapter two tonight. And don't ever forget, Nehemiah is not a book about a church uh, building campaign. (laughs) It is a book about rebuilding God's people uh, because of God's ultimate plan through his son, which is what Nehemiah is doing, basing his decisions on God's word. Tonight is lesson two. Lesson one was realizing you need to rebuild, but now lesson two, rebuilding requires a core team of rebuilders. So look in Nehemiah chapter two, and we'll pick up here in verse one. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Have you ever heard the phrase, someone is heart sick? This is where it's from, actually. So Nehemiah is, is sad, but not physically sick because of an illness. He, he looks physically sick because of heartbrokenness over the disarray of God's people. Uh, a good reminder here that it is okay to sometimes be so distraught over what's wrong that you feel physically sick over it. So, sometimes something is so bad that it should move you to that point. Think of Christ uh, with tears over the city of Jerusalem and its, and its waywardness. So Nehemiah has the same kind of feeling here. But notice then he's afraid. Why is he afraid? Because now is the moment. Do I tell the king how I'm feeling? The king has earthly power over me and my life and my livelihood. Do I tell him what's truly what God has laid on my heart? So here's a difficult moment in life. One of those moments where whichever one you take takes you on a very different choose your own adventure path, right? So verse 3, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad? So now I'm I'm going to do it. I'm going to say what needs to be said. When the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Now verse 4, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So if it took courage before, this takes even more courage. The king is saying, okay, no, what do you want? What, what is really going on here? And I love that in verse 4, so I pray to the God of heaven. Does anyone remember, has he been praying about this already before? Yes. How long? Do you remember? Anyone remember? Four months. Very good. So for four straight months, he's been praying. The Bible also says he's been fasting, probably intermittently. So intermittently fasting, but praying, very deeply concerned over this thing. So now after all of that, what I've called kneeling prayer, now he has one quick moment of walking prayer. I'm about to talk God, please help me. It's probably, probably that, that fast. So I pray to the God of heaven. Now verse 5, now he speaks to the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. Let me tell you a couple of things that are very interesting to me about this verse. We have no reason to believe that Nehemiah has a background in construction or administration. 
All we know of him is that he's been the king's cupbearer, which is the job where you sip stuff that could kill you, but it hopefully won't kill the king. <laughs> right? So his background, there's nothing in his resume that we know of, at least in the Bible, that equips him for this particular task, other than he sees a need and believes God can help him meet the need. That's it. There is no other like, I have a degree in, or I have this background with. No, nope. here's what God has presented as a need. I see it, so I believe God wants me to do it. So verse 5, here's what I believe God wants me to do based on what God's word has said in chapter 1. Verse 6, and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. Obviously something he's thought about a lot already. So now let's look at a couple things this might mean for our church. The title is at the top, Gathering a Team of Rebuilders, but here's some particular things we notice. Rebuilding requires recognizing and lamenting the sad state of things. Prayers of sadness that turn to God in trust. I don't want to spend too much time on number one because that's what chapter one was about. Nehemiah sees, hears the, the report of those who saw the duress of God's people and it moved him to incredible sorrow and weeping. But it is still in chapter two as well. He looked sick because he was heart sick. So again, don't miss that sometimes Christians about even our church should be heart sick over the state that it's in based on the state it could be in. But then never miss the obvious. And here's the obvious in number two, rebuilding. Here's the obvious. Wait for it. This is an important point though. Rebuilding requires a desire to rebuild. (laughs) So you can't rebuild unless you believe we need to rebuild and no one rebuilds who doesn't want to rebuild. So Nehemiah has a heart to rebuild. He knows he needs to rebuild. So after an appropriate time of lament, he's going to move forward to rebuild. But verse 5, send me so that I can rebuild what needs to be rebuilt. So the desire has to now come full bloom to a plan of action. I desire something, now I have to do something about it. And we'll see more about that as we keep reading. So let's pick up now in verse 7 of Nehemiah chapter 2. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. Notice these four months of prayer have given him time to think about a process and a plan. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked. So he's thought about it. These details show that this is not an off-the-cuff sort of thing. It's not, he just is throwing this together. There's been prayer and planning. But the reason that this can be successful, Nehemiah understands at the end of verse 8, for the good hand of my God was upon me. This brings me to a third application for our church. The first was, let's be sad when things aren't what they should be. Second, let's desire to rebuild. But now third, rebuilding the right foundation requires the good hand of my God. Now, I put the caveat in there, the right foundation, because you can build the wrong foundation without God's help. That is possible. But if you want to build the right foundation, only God can make it possible. Now, the Bible says this over and over. Let me show you a couple of verses. Psalm 127, I love this scripture. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. What a strong statement. No matter what you're doing, you should just not even be doing it. It's a complete waste of your life. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I'm here watching it. I'm here watching it. Well, unless God's at work through you, you might as well go to sleep because it doesn't matter. Proverbs 16 tells us about plans. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit, meaning the NIV translate, the Lord weighs our motives, which is very helpful. Verse three, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his, his steps. Nehemiah understands this. So he understands we have to have a desire to rebuild, put plans to it, thoughts to it, but it must be the good hand of God on it, or there is no hope <laughs> for it to be rebuilt. Now, this map will help you visualize to a degree, hopefully, some of the verses that are going to follow in terms of what Nehemiah looks at and how he starts to help Uh, God's people rebuild. But let's pick up in the text. So Nehemiah 2, back to verse 9. This is where we left off. 
Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Senbalath the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Now this will be revealed later in the book of Nehemiah, but I'll just try to explain to you now that commentators agree that Sambalat and Tobiah were most likely Jews by heritage. So when you read the Ammonite servant, understand it this way, the servant of the enemy, not that he is an Ammonite, he's a servant of the Ammonites, though he's a Jew. So in other words, these are traitors. All right, so these are people that have the background of they should be caring about rebuilding God's people, which are in disarray. Instead, they're opposing the work of God's rebuilding of his people. Derek Kidner explains that these two men will throw a long shadow over the story. Um, if you don't know it, our church has Right Now Media, which I encourage you to use. And Evangeline and I, tonight, before you guys got here, we're watching some of Nehemiah on Superbook right here on the screen. And Sam Bollett has a lot of scenes in it because he's in it a lot. So we'll read about him later in, in the book. But he's opposing God's work. That prepares us for some important things when it comes to rebuilding our church. Those who oppose God's work are greatly displeased at one who seeks the welfare of God's people. So notice this point. If we seek to obey God and rebuild His church His way, people will oppose it. I guarantee you they will oppose it. People will come out of the woodwork to oppose it. They always have. They always will. Now, some of the application will, will come from the outside. Um, in the first three or four months that I've been here, some of the things I've tried to do in the first three or four months were meet pastors in the area, meet community leaders in the area, tell them about our church, ask them to pray about our church, and many were overwhelmingly affirming. But a few do not want our church to do well. Um, there are always people like that. There are some people that see this property and would be very happy to bulldoze it and build something else here in this place. But we need to remember God has placed us here for a very important and urgent work. The North Carolina State Convention considers our church in proximity to the third greatest pocket of lostness in this area. Um, in fact, their newest survey, which came out this month, includes several people groups within five minutes of our church that they consider almost universally unreached. Some of them are not English speaking by their first language. So God actually has placed us in a place of great need, but we shouldn't be surprised if some don't welcome the advance of the gospel. That's how it's always been. Yet, and this is an important counterpoint, we must step outside to see how we are seen from the outside. Now, in the verses that follow, Nehemiah is going to take the, some fellow leaders and show them what the walls look like from the outside. He's going to take them outside the city and see, see, this is what those who are opposing you see when they see what you're, you're living like. Now, this is important because as a church, I'll put it here on the screen, we should always be willing to consider how we are seen by outsiders and make appropriate corrections. Uh, let me give a simple example, and then we can talk about it on a more profound level. Today, uh, thanks to Ken and LaDonna Clark, an, a couch was brought to my office. And the people who were bringing the couch, the company who were bringing it, did what nearly every person does who's brought something to the church during the week. They drove around and around the church, and then they called until they could figure out where the door is. <laughs> now, those of you who've gone here for a while, once you've been here for a month, you're like, everyone knows the door. Let me assure you, no one knows how to get in. No one. Our address is on Noble Road. There is no entrance on Noble Road. You drive this way. You look for the office sign. You don't know what that means. And then you circle around. I was meeting a missionary here once uh, who helps with, with NC State, and it was the funniest thing. I stood outside waving so that he would find me, and he drove around again. <laughs> so those things on a literal geographical level remind us. Sometimes it's good to step outside and see what does this look like to someone who is on the outside. Nehemiah does this as well. But also it's true on a spiritual level. How would what we're saying be heard to someone who did not grow up with it? How would what we're doing be understood to someone to whom it is not germane or 
indigenous. So Nehemiah gives us some practical wisdom here in the way he does this. Now on the screen, I hope I'm not hurting your vision, but I'm going to have a lot of very small points. If you can't see them, that's okay. But it'll help guide me to make sure I don't miss some of the passage here as it, as it floats out, because I think there's a lot of wisdom in the verses that, that follow here. All right, so pick up with me now in verse 11, and you're going to see what I just referred to. Nehemiah is going to show people the outside. Verse 11, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days, so three days to recover before a reconnaissance with some others. Verse 12, then I arose in the night, and a few men with me, notice just a few, the verse continues, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I, I need to pause on just a couple things here. All right, I told you in chapter one, or lesson one, Nehemiah is not a book on leadership per se, though it's often sold that way. It, it, it is a book on rebuilding God's people for the coming Christ, but it does teach a lot about leadership, which is why sometimes it's used that way. There is something we learn about leadership from Nehemiah here. He understands that not everyone is normally ready to see the problem. Just a few people probably can see things right now, so it only takes a few with him. He knows probably not everybody can bear the reality if they see it with their own eyes. There's another phrase here that we have to pause on, especially since my daughter loves Disney and was asking me tonight if we could ever go to Disney World. <laughs> Nehemiah says, this, this was on his heart. Now, there's a very bad way to use that phrase, where we mean, um, this is what I want, therefore it's right. But that's not the way Nehemiah is using it. Based on chapter 1, we know that he's following what he's convinced Scripture says must be done. Now, that is a good way that God works on our heart. Sometimes God uses his word to particularly burden us. That is a good way to use the phrase. That's how it's being used here. Verse 13, I went out by night. Why by night? because only a few people are ready to see how bad things are. By the valley gate, to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, and I expected the walls of Jerusalem now from the outside that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate. All of these were on the map I showed you earlier. And to the king's pool. And there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. And then I went up by night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned, because he's been doing this from the outside. Verse 16, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews. Jesus, I believe it's John 16, told his disciples this, I have more to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. And Nehemiah is following the same principle here. Sometimes not everybody is ready to realize how bad things are. They just couldn't handle it. So Nehemiah doesn't let everybody know. So he has a few people that are, he's bringing into early leadership, but others who are not yet ready. So verse 16 continues, I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Notice we will need their help at some point. But not yet are they ready to understand the situation in its fullness. And now verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Um, I want to show you a couple of things here. Nehemiah is now sharing the trouble of their current situation after he has shown them things. Derek Kidner, in his very good commentary on Nehemiah, writes this. Sometimes... It takes a stranger to see sharply what has been softened by familiarity. So Nehemiah has a benefit in that he's not been there. And so because he comes as an outsider, he sees it more clearly. It's kind of like the old phrase, if you ask a fish what is water, they don't know, right? Uh, so let me tell you a true story of how this passage was very helpful to me. A number of years ago in Michigan, there was a church that had really fallen on very, very hard times. It, had, it was a step or two away from closing its doors. They were down to a very small amount of people. They had lost their pastor. Everything was going really badly. And they reached out for help from area state, state churches. And I was involved with some of these churches as we were trying to think through how we could help this church. And so one of the pastors in our state uh, was blessed with a lot of families that he could send over to this church because it wasn't that far. And we all knew a guy who had graduated seminary recently who would be a very good pastor for them. 
So we were able to supply the church with a new pastor and with about 20 or 30 new members to help reinfuse some life and to help get them going. But we did tell the church up front, especially the older pastor who was helping me, now listen, it's very important that you have some humility in receiving these new members and allowing this new pastor to help lead you. Uh, you guys are at a very difficult stage here, but if we can work together, we can grow. And they assured us, yes, absolutely we will. And sure enough, about two months later, they came and said, well, you know what? We just feel like the way we've been doing things is fine, and we don't need anybody's help. But just a few months earlier, they had realized we desperately need somebody's help. But when it came down to it, to have someone from the outside was just unacceptable to them. So I sent uh, my pastor friend, Derek Kidner's comment from this exact scripture. Sometimes a stranger can see more sharply what we with familiarity have been softened to. This principle is a very important one and one that allows Nehemiah to be very helpful. All right, now verse 17 continues. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. So notice, though he is a stranger and that he hasn't been there as long as them, he views them as a collective team. Let us do this together. We're all in this together. Let's all lift up arms together so that we no longer suffer derision. Suffer derision is a phrase in the Bible that speaks to the consequences of our sins. So just know that it has spiritual overtones in Scripture. Verse 18. He gives them encouragement now. And I told them of the hand of my God, remember the one that he talked about in verse 8, that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to them. So he's encouraging them. Look, here's what God can do. And God has already caused Artaxerxes to give me favor to come here. God can, we can do this. This is capable. God can do this, verse 18. And then they said, this small group, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. So notice in God's grace, he is now gathering a team of rebuilders. Uh, and I have all these on the screen here, but I haven't been clicking them. Uh, so now to the last one, verse 19 and 20. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem and the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Notice here my fifth point underneath this one. Nehemiah persists despite sinful opposition, which is always present when good is being done, but Nehemiah is able to persist by faith in God's ability. Notice now verse 20. Then I, Nehemiah, replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. You know why this answer is so striking? What was the charge they made of him in verse 19? They said, you can't do this because of what reason? You see it in verse 19. I want to make sure you're... you're rebelling against the king. Right. They said, you can't do this, Nehemiah, because you'd be rebelling against the king. But is that actually true, or does he actually have the king's approval? He has a king's approval, but he doesn't invoke it in verse 20. He doesn't say, no, actually, I have King Artaxerxes' approval. Why not? Because Nehemiah knows where the power actually comes from. So in verse 20, instead of saying... No, actually, I have a degree and I have a certification and I have the king's approval. No, no. He says, no, God can do this. I love that. <laughs> the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you who won't do the right thing, you will have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So God can do this. He will do this. But those of you who oppose it, you're not going to be part of the blessing. That's how this is going to go. I love that clarity that he brings to them in verse 20. So Nehemiah appeals to the one place where there really is power. Now we can talk about some specific applications for us. We already looked at this first one. Opposition can come from outside. But now let's look at the next one. Even on the inside, number two, even on the inside, not everyone is ready for a rebuild at first. This is why Nehemiah only takes a few people with him. Not everybody's ready for the work. And in some ways, that's okay. We're all at different levels in terms of where we're at spiritually. Number three, in order to rebuild, though, God must provide at least a small group. And that small group must clearly see the seriousness of the problems, but also see the power of God's hand to rebuild. They must be people who are ready, according to verse 18, to strengthen their hands for the good work. So Nehemiah cannot do this alone, and he knows he cannot do it alone. So he must gather a team of rebuilders who also 
have faith in what God can do and are ready to strengthen their hands for the work. Number four, as the rebuilding commences in earnest, the opposition typically increases. And we'll see it heat up throughout the book. So now let me give, as I said I would do, Lord willing, each Wednesday night, specific action steps for us. I'll give us three things to pray for tonight. I'll walk through each three slowly, and then I'll put all three and leave them on the screen so that when we pray, they're all right there for us. So here's the first. First thing I want to encourage you to pray with me tonight. Lord, are there areas that our church needs to be revitalized or rebuilt? Lord, are there areas that our church needs to be revitalized or rebuilt? And we see this in Nehemiah 2, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. So he's looking, are there other people that see there's a need for rebuilding? And if so, come, let us build together the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Now, as we pray that, we need to do so in a God-centeredness where we understand it's not about us having a better church. It's about Christ's name being better glorified through our church. Kathy Keller, who has a very good chapter on this book of Nehemiah in her commentary, writes this. Nehemiah begins in a remarkably God-centered way, recognizing God's complete freedom. God actually owes us nothing. Derek Kidner says Nehemiah begins by putting us in our place. She continues then, uh, if this thing works, no, there we go. When we don't realize how infinitely great God is, all kinds of distortions creep into our thinking. We panic or obsess because we forget that our God is infinitely great. Ironically, admitting God owes us nothing and that He is majestic, high, and lofty brings more peace than lots of crying out with desperate petitions. Man, I'm hitting the wrong buttons with my fingers tonight. I'm sorry. After adoration comes confession. But this too comes before any petition. After adoring God's infinite highness and confessing our smallness, we realize God owes us nothing, and therefore we come empty-handed. That's the only way we can come into His presence. There's no way we can put a claim on God. Let me summarize what she's saying this way. If God brings you to a place of, I don't know how we can do this, then you're in the place God wants you to be. (laughs) God, I, I, I have no claim other than you alone are capable and worthy of glory So I come in my smallness and ask for your greatness. So number one, pray, Lord, are there any things you want revitalized in my life in our church? Number two, pray, Lord, make me willing and able to do what you want done for your church. Don't forget what verse five said. Nehemiah said to King Artaxerxes, send me so that I may rebuild this because the Lord has put this on my heart. And now he's asking others to join him. So verse 18, and then I told them, of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. What sweet words that must have been to his ears. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. I'll quote Kathy Keller again, who says this. This is a tangent, but I really want you to remember this, she writes. Often God calls you to a ministry by making you the one who sees the need that others don't. Rather than haranguing your pastor, your elders, or the person in the seat next to you about why they don't have a ministry to the elderly, why the church is not doing a vacation Bible school in that needy neighborhood over there, or why they don't have this or that support for married couples, realize that perhaps you are seeing the need because God is calling you to be the one who meets the need, the one who starts the ministry or just starts doing it yourself. This is something I've observed many, many times in our 40 years in the ministry with her and her husband, Tim. Somebody will be really agitated and asking why the church isn't doing this or that. And I say, well, you're seeing it. And you're agitated because God has given you the ministry to do something about it. So the next time you have a burr under your saddle blanket about something, just consider it might be God who put it there. I actually always rejoice as a pastor when someone comes to me and says, Pastor, I think we really need this. Then I'm like, great, you're the guy, you know. (laughs) That is always an encouraging thing. And it really, all seriousness though, the Spirit does burden us and equip us for things that need to be done. And that's a good thing. Number three, rejoice when you pray though. Because the power to rebuild comes from King Jesus. Thus, as we build His way, 
Let us be confident he will build his church. Don't miss verse 20, the one I told you I love so much. So after he says, we need to rebuild, and then he says, will you help us rebuild? He then says, God is able to help us rebuild. That's, that's the heart of what his message is. And in fact, actually, there's a confidence in it. God will make us prosper as we arise and rebuild. So it's not passivity. God will work through us, but I know he will work. And this exact phraseology is applied to you and I about the church. So when we, when I, feel discouraged, I don't know how our church is going to rebuild, we start with these kind of truths. Jesus, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So on the one hand, we can lament and feel like things need to grow or change. But on the other hand, we have a settled confidence. Christ can build his church. And as we build on Christ, we want to build Christ's way. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 13. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with good silver, Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So Christ has the power, and He empowers us when we do it His way, when we do it according to His Word. I'll quote Keller with each one of these points, so here's her final comments. God's people do not need to be powerful culturally or in power politically, to be obedient to Him and to accomplish His purposes in the world. All they need to do to glorify Him and join the great sweep of redemptive history is to be faithful to the one who's called them by His own name. Let us not do less than Nehemiah, because we are called by the one who is greater than Nehemiah, and He will accomplish it. So here are the three things for us to pray tonight. Lord, are there areas that our church, including myself, needs to be revitalized or rebuilt, and that was Nehemiah 2.18. Lord, make me willing and able to do what you want done for your church. That was verse 19. And then rejoice. The power to rebuild comes from King Jesus. Thus, as we build his way, let us be confident he will rebuild his church. So let me pray for us, and then we'll turn off the video, and then I'll share updates about people in our church, what's going on with them, and then we'll pray for our church. So let me pray right now. Dear God, I thank you so much that the person who we look to to rebuild the church is the person who promised that even the gates of hell could not prevail against us. Give us great encouragement and hope that no matter what's happening globally, nationally, regionally, locally, you are able to rebuild your church. So thank you, Lord, for the foundation that has been laid at our church, the name and work of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would build on it with gold, silver, and precious stones, and that when the great day reveals it, there would not be wood, hay that needs to be burned, but instead there would be an edifice that is all to your glory. Sometimes we need to rebuild because the walls have come down. And so, Lord, I thank you for what we see from Nehemiah, from Nehemiah chapter 2, a burden to see the church in his case, the temple, the people rebuilt so that your promises could be fulfilled. And so, Lord, we, we, we pray, where would you want our church revitalized, rebuilt? May we have eyes to see it. Secondly, he had to appeal to other people. Will you help us? Will you strengthen your hands? Will you come with us? And Lord, I pray you would ask, enable all of us to genuinely ask, Lord, what can I do? How can I be a part of the rebuilding? But third, the confidence ultimately comes to not our human authority. I'm so glad Nehemiah did not appeal to King Artaxerxes or to his resume, but instead he said, the good hand of my God will cause us to prosper. And so, Lord, to you alone we look because we know that the laborer labors in vain unless the Lord raises the house and the watchman stays awake in vain unless the Lord watches the city. And so, Lord, we ask you to rebuild Emmanuel Baptist Church over your time frame and to do so for your glory, for the advance of the gospel in this community. Bring many people to saving faith. Uh, Lord, I pray we'd see people baptized. We'd see missionaries sent out. 
we would see great revival, and I pray that it would start within my own heart and that um, you would do that work in your grace and mercy. In Christ I pray, amen. All right.